Okay. Boom, boom, clap. <laughs> Don't do it. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The show's gonna last three weeks! And now here's your host, Rich Outfield. Six seasons in a movie! And Big Anklevich. Six seasons in a movie. Six seasons in a movie. Oh, come on. Everybody, welcome to the Doomsday Audio Fiction Magazine. I am Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And I think we should involve Announcer Man somehow in this episode, more than we usually do. I think Rich is right. But what for? Just, I mean, we've got him here, we might as well use him. True, but, you know, I just keep him in that closet all the time. I didn't expect the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, so we'll see if we can give him something to do. Um, why don't you start by asking us who the story is by, announcer man? How about telling me about today's author? Uh, funny you should ask, announcer man. Turns out today's story is by one Richelieu Benjamin Outfield Jr. the Third. Jeez, where's that set of earplugs I brought? <laughs> Um, this is the this is sort of a tradition for us, right? Uh, every year we do one of these. Uh, I guess you could say that. Uh, although. An episode that angers people and makes them stop listening to the show. <laughs> uh, this this was actually supposed to be last year's episode that angered people, but we never got around to it. So here it is this year instead. Why did I even show up today? But yeah, you, do you think we're going to anger a lot of people, or do you think people can understand? Oh, geez. I don't know. I mean, I, I like to give our fans the benefit of the doubt because they're our fans, you know? they. Uh, so they should be smarter than usual. Well, that's for sure. But uh, they've listened to our show, presumably other than just this one episode. So they know what they're getting. They know who we are. They know who I am. Uh, but, uh, you know, something happened last year that made me a little bit afraid of... Uh, okay, uh, Big, you know what my concern is on this episode. Help me out here. Well, yeah, okay, before we start the story, we're just going to do a sort of a disclaimer. Warning, the following episode contains movie spoilers. If you plan to see the no, movie... No, not that kind of a disclaimer, uh, announcement. It's a different one. Warning, today's episode contains the Q word. No, no, uh, not that one either, uh, announcement. I mean, it does probably contain a Q word or two, but... Uh, that's that's not the disclaimer I was thinking of. Warning. Today's episode contains comments from Rich Outfield. Listener discretion is advised. Yeah, that's the one out announcement. Thanks. This is supposed to be a funny sketch, okay? Or sketch is the word you like, right? And skit is the one you don't like? There you go. Okay. This is a funny sketch. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 this is barbecue sketch number three. Now, if you've heard barbecue sketch number one and two, then you know that we're having a couple guys. They're hanging out around the barbecue, and they are what trying to one up each other. I guess is kind of the deal. Yes. And so they're one upping each other in different ways each time. The first one was a marriage one upsmanship. The second one was Raising Children One-Upsmanship. And now this one is... Do I want to give it away or do I want to not give it away? Well, the title may be a bit of a giveaway. Uh, it's a Progressivism. Okay. A Being Progressive One-Upsmanship. Now, hopefully you can listen to this and just enjoy it and understand that it is just poking fun. It is not, we're not stating our beliefs in this sketch. We are not trying to denigrate anyone's beliefs in this sketch. It is just having a good time. It's all just have a good time and we can, if you can't laugh at yourself, then, you know, what can you laugh at? I think that's really where humor starts, is being able to laugh at yourself. And if you see yourself in this, then hopefully you can laugh at it. That's kind of what we're going for with this. Okay, hey, that's way better than what I would have said. I would have simply said, if you think that this is making fun of you, you're better than that. Awful. 
so thank you, Big. Uh, again, just whether it's funny or not, I guess uh, this is our third one. And if people like it, I'm sure we'll do another one. Uh, in fact, it seems like Marshall had some suggestion of what the fourth one could be. Um, but uh, we'll talk about that afterward, right? Sure. Okay, so we're going to head on into the story. It is Be Progressive. Be, 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 be progressive. progressive. And it's not, it turns out, about auto insurance. It's about something else. So uh, we will see you guys on the other side when the story is over. Okay. Be Progressive. Be, be progressive by Rich Outfield. You gave to me a moment in time. Thanks for inviting us out to your family barbecue, Carlson. Not a problem. We're all neighbors. That makes us family. We're very progressive on this block, Andy. Whatever you say a family is, a family is. Well, that sounds good. We're progressive in our household, too. Good to hear it. Same here. We strive to be progressive, not just in deed, but in thought as well. And in speech too, Baxter. Don't forget that. What a refreshing change. We've strived to raise our children in as liberal, open-minded an environment as possible. And so far, it seems to be working. All three of us have a lot in common then, Andy. Well, for example, little Donovan said something to me yesterday. He said, why do they call Obama the black president? What does color matter? Wow. That's a good question. Why do they call him the black? No, the point is, my son sees beyond color. I've raised him in a colorblind home. You've done a great job with your kids. We've tried to do the same. Yeah, us too. We have never said the N-word in our household. Oh, cool. That's how it should be. I've never said the N-word in my life. Good job. I've never even thought the N-word. I, uh... Have never even heard it. I I don't know what the N-word is. But I thought you saw that Quentin Tarantino movie where they say it uh, at least... You know what I mean, Carlson. Uh, Sounds like we're all three very liberal, open-minded fathers. That's not how I was raised, so I really tried to avoid all racism. Us too. There's no racial slurs allowed in our home of any kind. Us either. Not even the ones about gypsies or Quakers. We don't even let the kids eat crackers, since that's... You know, it's technically a racial slur. Is it? See, I'm so colorblind, I don't even know. We don't even use pejoratives like saying Australians are Aussies or calling Latinos Mexicans. Or or WAP for Italians. No, Andy, that one really is a racial slur. Oh, sorry, I I didn't know. Because we don't use it. Good for you, Andy. In our household, we have our minds open for all people's cultures, all ethnicities, All religions. Us too. I taught the kids to be respectful of people's beliefs. Or lack of beliefs. That's right. Every religion deserves respect, even the crazy made-up religions. Like Buddhists? No, that's a real religion. I meant like Scientologists or Wiccans. Oh, well, that's admirable, but it's hard to do in our evil right-wing environment. We don't. I taught my kids not to uh, judge Judge those those on on the the right right either. Oh, uh, sure. They are free to live their lives, just as we want to live ours. What about gays? What about them? You don't discriminate against gays, do you? Me? No, no. I I was just saying, I raised my kids to respect gays. They're people, too. Totally. Just like everybody else. Two dads is just as valid as a mom and a dad. Or two moms. Or three moms and one dad, like in the desert. No insensitivity to alternate lifestyles in my household. If you're gay or bisexual or transgendered... Or transvestites or furries or bi-curious... Or tri-curious... Or asexual... Or into plants... Or bugs. That's right. All-inclusive. That's our watchword. I told my kids they could marry puppets if they want to. You did? Puppets? Yeah, when they grow up. Right, right. And what about drugs? Oh, yeah. I taught my kids about drugs when they were three. What did you teach them, Baxter? (laughs) What do you mean? That they're bad? Oh, hell no. Drugs are a reasonable option. 
We told our kids they were free to experiment just as long as they did it responsibly. Yeah, we encouraged our kids to try drugs and just so they'll be more sensitive to those with addiction problems or weaknesses. Using drugs is not a weakness. No, no, you know what I mean. We forced our children to use drugs when they were first walking. That's great. We, we told them we wanted them to be junkies if that's how they choose to live their lives. Very progressive. Except you don't want to use the word junkie. That's insensitive. Sorry, I, I was like taking it back. You know, using it as a cool word, like when you say gay means happy. Oh, well, I'm not sure if that's okay. Someone might be upset by it. We always want to be sensitive to the feelings of others in my family. Right. Us too. Not just the majority's feelings either, but the minorist minorities. What about devil worshippers? Huh? What are we saying about them, tolerance-wise? Oh, devil worship is okay. Any worship is just as valid as any other. Or non-worship, or middling almost worship, like people who believe in Jedi stuff. Or Spock's religion. Right, or Hinduism. Good, good, because we're totally raising our kids to be devil worshippers. That's uh, great. Very progressive. That shows those closed-minded idiots in the Midwest, dude. Not that there's anything wrong with uneducated people. <laughs> oh, no. Someone with a GED is just as valuable as someone with a doctorate. More valuable. Right. I told my kids not even to go to school. That's more valuable than them all. What? You told them not to go? I took them out of school. Too much flag-waving and heart-holding. Oh, right. That's great, then. Not, not that I was judging. Everyone is free to pursue an education or refuse one. That's right. Our society needs all kinds. It needs people on welfare just as much as the super-rich. More so than the super-rich. Uh, well, all my kids are going to be on welfare and on drugs. And maybe cannibals. Wow. You know, you're the most progressive of us all, Andy. You're a true example. We could all learn a lot from the way you're raising your family. Well, thanks. But, look, my, my kids don't really worship the devil. They don't? Well, that's their right. Just as long as you don't push them into it. Well, I, I won't push my children, no. Good, good. Motivating children towards something takes away their freedom of choice. And I actually don't hope they end up on welfare. But if they do, well, then they're contributing to society. You know, just as much as... In uh, fact, a lot of what I was saying wasn't really true. I just wanted to fit in. You don't have to fit in, Andy. That's the beauty of this country in the 21st century. Well, I'm sure some of the things you guys said weren't entirely true, right? No. All true. Uh, every word. Oh. Well, I, I gotta go. Thought I'd read to the kids before bed. Oh, see you. Good night. I would never give my children a bedtime. Of course not. They should decide on their own when they want to sleep. If they even want to sleep at night. What a jerk. I knew there was something wrong with that guy. Sprinkles are for winners. I understand. All right, everybody, welcome back. Did you enjoy the story? Did you, was your blood pumping? Were your anger seething? Hopefully you were able to just see it as funny. Because that's what it was meant to be. It wasn't meant to be hurtful. Um, but it's weird. Well, we tend to put disclaimers on episodes that we fear may be bothersome to people. And it's always the ones that we don't even consider that upset people. So hopefully, right. again, uh, we brought a big umbrella and it didn't even get cloudy that day. So, Yeah, that would be the best way for it to have worked out. Uh, a really quick cast list for this, uh, this story. You had three characters in the story. They were played by, let's see, the character of Andy was played by Rish Outfield. The character of Carlson was played by Johnny Feisty. Wow. Yeah. Haven't heard from him in a long time. Well, like, we only heard from him that one time, dude. True. And this is that same time. <laughs> and then the character of Baxter 
was played by Dave Thompson, Podcastle Enforcer, without a Podcastle to enforce now. Ex-Podcastle Enforcer. So those are our three characters, and you may have guessed, judging by the fact that we had those three characters, or those three voice actors playing those three characters, this was... Another one of the things that we recorded live at the New Media Expo. Still, it was already 2014 by then? It was. It was January, so it was barely 2014. But yeah, it's been a long time since we recorded this, and we're finally just getting it out. But I think that was intentional. I, I was worried that we'd do two of them in a row or two close together, and so it it just felt like, okay, well, we'll just do one a year. Yeah, I had them planned to be about six months apart, but then our schedule, our production schedule kind of slowed as the year went along. And so, yeah, then it wound up being a year. But, you know, whatever. It's all good. It's not like the jokes became less fun. Uh, Now they're all too on the nose. What does on the nose mean, Big? (laughs) I have no... Don't you think that's a little too on the nose, (laughs) Rish? I have no idea what that means. I'll have to admit. See, the the actual answer to that is there was an episode of Smallville where Clark really liked Lana and he stared at her in the high school longingly and Jewel sang in the background, Do you want me like I want you? And at that moment... I realized what on the nose meant. Oh, okay. True story. True story. Nice. (laughs) It's funny, this sketch about uh, political humor. Uh, We happened to do this, and just by chance, right before, while I was waiting for you to get home from work, I happened to watch, somebody had linked to it on Facebook, and so I watched a video of an Australian comedian doing a comedy bit about gun control. Yeah, when he gets to the end of it, he's just like, yeah, you know, the funny thing about this whole thing is 50% of you really like what I had to say, and 50% of you really hate what I had to say. And then he went down through the percentages. This many percent of you that hated what I had to say were able to see it as a joke and just laugh at it. And, you know, he just kept going on and on down this list of the percentages of who hated what how much but i guess that's just kind of one of the things that you got to deal with if you're going to do any comedy that involves politics yeah i mean that's one of the reasons you and i tend to not try and talk about politics or religion on the show is because it's insanely polarizing people have really thin i mean unusually thin skins when it comes to those two subjects You and I see it on Facebook all the time because it seems like half of the people that post or whatever you call it that uh, that are my friends on Facebook are uh, on one side and half are on the other side. And there's nobody that's like straight down the middle. And I think I like some of this and some of that. A little from column A, a little from column B. Try the gray stuff. It's delicious. (laughs) But it's funny because people will get upset. You don't believe me. Ask the dishes. They tell jokes. They do tricks with the... Anyway, I can't remember. Sorry. (laughs) You're mixing two movies. Do you realize that? Oh, my gosh. Aladdin and... uh... The column A and column B was Aladdin. (laughs) And the other one was Beauty and the Beast. The gray stuff, It's Delicious, was Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Okay, don't tell anybody. Let them continue to believe that I am brilliant. (laughs) But, yes, the point I was trying to make is uh, people get really, really upset, even when... It's just a bunch of Facebook friends or whatever, and somebody has posted like a fake uh, article or or video or, you know, something that's that's obviously parody because it goes so far. An onion article. uh, Or like an onion thing. Anyway, I know that there are people that have unfriended one another or or what do you call? It's a step before unfriending where you no longer see what uh, those guys post. Yeah, I think it's unsubscribing or blocking or something like that. Over things like that. And, uh, you know, we, we've been on both sides of that and, uh, maybe that will happen with this story or this sketch, but if people laugh and think it's fun, then I, like I said before, I'll try and come up with another one. The problem is we, we don't get together with people, um, when 
when we were still planning on doing the New Media Expo this year, I told the everybody I would do a sketch for the ladies. Oh. And, uh, you know, I'd come up with this uh, sketch that's set in a sorority house with a new girl that's, uh, I mean, they call it a, a pledge in a frat. I would assume in a sorority she's called a pledge as well. But it was all, you know... Uh, to give like Renee and, and Abby and uh, Lauren, if she's there, but, uh, you know, all of them a chance to do a part instead of it just being the dudes that get around doing a, a barbecue sketch. Yeah, that would be good. Maybe we can still manage some kind of a get together this year. We'll have to see. We kind of have let it slide until it may be too late. I hope not, but you never know. Yeah, it's uh, too bad. The world is just too big. Yeah. You know, like I sometimes I try and get a, a call with Gino Moretto on the wait. Dee, 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 dee. Yeah, I was a little slow there on Skype or, or you know, something. We're going to do some kind of call. And because he lives so far away, it's night when it's day here. And uh, when it's night here, it's uh, next Thursday. It's always next Thursday, which is so weird where he is. And so, uh, yeah, I've never been able to manage to get a call with uh, Gino Moretto. I still don't know what he sounds like. But uh, well, the point I was trying to make is the world is just too big. It's hard for us to see everybody. It is, yeah. It's hard to take the people around the world and, that want to be together and put them together because travel's not cheap. It's not easy. I mean, it's not covered wagons anymore, at least, so there's that. But it takes some effort sometimes. You know, it's funny with this skit. The, or, oh, no, you didn't. Oh, shoot, I said that word. How dare you? Gonna, None of that talk now. The, Thank you, announcer man. You're going to rage quit the show now, aren't you? <laughs> uh, the, re- uh, the reason why we started out with our big disclaimer at the start uh, is because the, we did one of the stories from the New Media Expo last year, just had an offhand joke said by a character in the story, not by us in the post-story talk or anything like that, and, uh, yeah, there was somebody who just got really upset and went and put comments, angry comments about politics in more than one place. I want to say one on the blog and one on Facebook. About us, about what we must think and what we must believe and how dumb we must be, which is so strange because the, the story was not about that at all. And... We, I mean, we didn't even comment on it. It was just some silly little tiny throwaway line. It was throwaway that was meant to be amusing or like an in-joke between the two characters on there. But yeah, he took it as like, oh, how dare you push your politics on me? Well, you want to, I'll push back. Yeah, so. And it wasn't Tom Tam Creedy, even though I just did my Tom Tam Creedy voice. Sorry. <laughs> That's your Tom Tam Creedy voice. Oh, nice. Sure, he'll love it. It was just strange. Uh, if that guy still listens to the show, I know that he's he's already spontaneously combusted. You know, he's not even hearing us talk about it by now because he has gone up in flames. So there's that. We can just move on and not worry about that, I guess. Tell us about... Uh, we didn't do an author's note for this story. Tell us about the writing of this story, Rish Outfield. What led you to write a story like this? I don't know that this is a story, again. Okay, it's sketch i was at san diego comic-con the last time which was 2013 uh they wouldn't let me back last year but they did charge me and uh i was at my hotel room and something was on tv it was true blood or game of thrones or one of those shows on pay tv but i couldn't watch it because i was behind i you know i was like a season behind and i was like oh now what do i do and a normal person would like read or sleep but I, I was really wanting to write something. And, and I, yeah, I came up with this sketch. Um, I mean, by that point, we had already done a New Media Expo and it was a really good experience. And we had done a barbecue sketch. And, and so I thought it would be fun to write a second one. And this was the second one that I wrote. Then later I came up with an idea for the third one, which was, you know, my kids are so great. My kids are better than your kids kind of thing. And I don't think I explored that as much as I could have explored it. I mean, we could do a, a another one of those one-upmanship things about the kid that wasn't just, you know, how good my kid is at sports or, you know. And Marshall's kid ended up having, like, 
<laughs> the ability to bring dead people back to life. <laughs> but and the other kid, you know, he was like a, an action hero. I mean, he was like a real Jeff Speakman. So you know, that's almost as good as bringing people back to life. But anyhow, yeah, uh, I I think we all got together in in January. And we recorded, though, or maybe I just wanted to record one, but they were cool enough to let us do both. And yeah, it seems like one of the guys came up with an, a, an idea. Oh, and you could do one like this. And so, yeah, if ever we get together again, I'm sure we can do a fourth barbecue sketch. I mean, unless this one ends up being terribly, terribly offensive to people and and people completely lose their minds and or senses of humor over it. I, I don't think that's going to happen. Usually when I say, okay, hey guys, we, we use terms for w- female anatomy in this episode, so I'm just giving you a heads up. Nobody cares. But uh, anyhow, it would be neat. I, was it you? Who was it that had an idea for what the, a fourth barbecue sketch could be? Oh, shoot. If I had an idea for it, I don't remember what it is anymore, which is weird because I usually remember ideas. Maybe it was just a bad idea, so that's why I don't remember it. I'll start thinking about it, though, what people could one-upsmanship each other on. And, you know, recently I, I saw uh, I saw an interview with John Cleese, and it occurred to me that I think I, I was either referring to or ripping off a sketch that he wrote for a show called finally the 1948 show or something like that called the Yorkshireman. And it's these guys who are all talking about how terrible their childhood was and they one up each other. And then it became really famous because they did it on Mighty Python. And I, I, I always laugh. Look, sure. Exactly. That's the line I was going to do is uh, Graham Chapman says, look, sure. Well, we had it hard. And yeah, they just talk. If you've never heard that Monty Python sketch, it's so good. It just becomes more and more ridiculous how bad their childhood is. I mean, to the point where it becomes absolute fiction with uh, like their father shooting them all and then dancing about on their graves. And that's what they'd go through as children. And then it ends with, you know, but if if you tell young people about this today, they won't believe you. (laughs) So that it's kind of my uh, homage to that. Yeah, that's, there's been a lot of, I, th- I would say, homages to that. I wanted, Didn't they do something similar to that? Was it on Saturday Night Live or something where there was a character was just the one-upper? Kind of like Debbie Downer where every time somebody said something, they go, oh, yeah, well, I had this. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and it's, what's her you know, name? Uh, Kristen Wiig did a character who she always had to be better. Or, and, and it was kind of amusing, but it would get really, really rough because she was just, she was horrible. She was awful. Yeah, everything that you had suffered or learned or achieved, she had to be 10 times greater. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. I don't think that influenced these barbecue sketches at all. But, you know, it doesn't just have to be three dudes. But uh, when we were talking about it before, I thought that this could have been something that you and me and Ian did in college as like a little short film. And we could have done a bunch of them. And... uh, there were some guys, there were little groups of friends that would get together and make videos at our, our film school. And we would, uh, I, I don't want to say that we competed with them, but there was a little bit of competition because there was limited amounts of, of places where you could see these things. And then there were always like student film competitions or festivals where you actually were competing with other people. And there were these guys who, I think there were four of them, And they started making these sketches of four guys sitting around a breakfast table or dinner table. It might have been that these guys were four roommates and it was actually in their apartment around the dinner table. And they would just like sort of ad lib these little sketches, ruminations of, you know, where they would be silly characters. And the audiences ate these things up. And I remember seeing the first one and being like, eh, yeah, you can tell that that's all ad-libbed, you know. It would have been better if they had had some kind of structure or whatever. But, oh, the audience loved it. And so they would do it again and again. And by the third or fourth time when it was the same thing of the same people, um, I got really angry. And so I wrote one where it was the four of us, you and me and Ian and Rob, sitting at a table and we were all 
doing inane chatter where we're talking about uh, movies or something like that. And at the very end of the sketch, um, somebody picks up a pistol and we all start playing Russian roulette. (laughs) And it was just me saying F you to you guys that keep doing the same thing over and over again. And we never actually got together and, and filmed this thing. I don't know if you guys even saw this sketch that I wrote, but I've always been kind of like that, where it's just, I really resent the people that just do the same thing over and over and over again. And uh, I didn't expect the Spanish Inquisition. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just, I, I was thinking of these barbecue things and, uh, you know, we could get together and, and make barbecue sketches uh, in the pre-YouTube world, just as long as we had a time machine and could go back to that time and do these sketches. Yeah, that would be perfect. You know what? If I had a time machine, I think I might do a bunch of other things before I ever went back to do barbecue sketches. Okay, well, invest in the stock market, right? <laughs> Dump all of your your dot-com stocks right before Y2K. Kill Hitler and then the barbecue sketch, right? Yeah, that's probably the order that they would go in, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I have fun with these. When we did this at the New Media Expo, we did the one and then we did the other one right after it. And there were six guys in our group that time. And so we just split it right down the middle. Uh, you three are going to do this sketch and you three are going to do that sketch. And... Yeah, we had ourselves a great time reading through these, and we had a lot of laughs and a lot of fun. And I remember us even being worried about this sketch just in the performing of it. We're like, okay, you guys who are performing this, listen, it's just for fun. Please don't hate us and stop hanging out with us while we're here in Vegas. We were a little nervous at what kind of reception this one might get because, you know, we hadn't, we read it and we laughed at it and... But, you know, we also thought our episode about cats was one of the best. So Cue the hate mail. Sometimes we don't have a good gauge as to what the public will be able to handle. And it was fun when they started chuckling here and there as they read the, the sketch and as they performed it. And, you know, we were able to breathe easy and just have a good time with it. And I thought it turned out really well. And I thought, you know, Johnny and uh, Dave did a great job with their stuff. The guy who played Andy kind of sucked. But, you know, we're used to that. Well, there's always a weak link in every sketch. Uh, yeah. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. Huh? That was your cue to say, oh, man, that is so dated. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would have been so dated uh, our very first episode. You could, if you had a time machine, you could go back in time and stop that show from ever being made and kill Hitler and help England to win the World Cup in 1986. And do the barbecue sketch. <laughs> oh, yes, barbecue sketch. Yeah, that comes right after the World Cup thing. But yeah, that was, that was one of the really fun things. The, one of the best things, I think, about the barbecue sketches is that they're very different than anything else that we do in that uh, it's just dialogue. It's really quick in coming. You know, everybody has a little something to say and the lines are going back and forth quickly. You don't have to sit and wait for the narrator to to do his thing in between. And uh, it's kind of like performing a play or something like that. And then in the case of these stories, we do it while we're in the presence of the other people. It's not even over Skype or something like that. It's actually right there, and they're right across the room from you, and they're saying their lines. And I think that's one of the most, you know, it's it's one of the things that makes it the most fun and makes the lines the funniest, is that you're right there with them, you know, and and able to hear and... uh, see I guess even see the reaction on their face see their smile it's like we've talked about a lot of times when you go to a film in a theater versus watching it on a DVD at home you know a movie is laugh out loud funny in a theater but at home you just smile you still think it's funny but you don't laugh out loud when you're at home that's why I always want to go to one of those 
forty uh, second Street uh, adult theaters from the seventies. <laughs> Wait, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry, I was still thinking of time travel. That's why I always wanted to be in that theater with Paul Rubens that time, just to get that uh, communal experience. <laughs> Uh, and now it's time for plug it in, plug it in. Ooh. Oh, come on. Wow. That's lame, even for you guys. Yeah. yeah, announcer man's usually the one that says terrible. But in this case, ooh, I'm going to say it. Yeah, okay, I forgot. At the end of the show, we're supposed to promote something of ours. And it, whose turn is it? I think it's yours. Okay. If you want to go buy uh, Dead Money by Dean Wesley Smith, that's a book of his that I narrated that's available on audible.com. And we talk about Dean Wesley Smith a lot, like we actually know the guy. Oh, but I thought of another one. Okay. You remember big back when we used to care about the show, we would do these things called incentive episodes. Oh, yeah, I remember those. Yeah, it seems like a long time ago. Huh? Those are fun. But, you know, we actually recorded one long ago uh, with Marshall Latham, where we had him in the uh, studio, and uh, we did a story called Last Call. Oh, yeah, I remember Marshall Latham. Yeah, long dead. But back when he wasn't, (laughs) we had him do a show with us, and uh, it was a story called Last Call, and uh, we just did a whole episode. You know, we've done these incentive episodes before, but it's been a while, and... Ah, oh, shoot. What is the deal on the incentive episodes? Uh, the deal was that if you are a subscriber, you know, you, you donate uh, five bucks a month or whatever, you subscribe to the show that way. Or if you just donate a one-time donation, uh, we'll, we'll email you the link to where you can download this special episode. So if you would like to hear this story, all you got to do is donate to the show. It could be a little, it could be a lot. Nobody will judge you. And yeah, then you'll get access to this uh, this story. Tell them about the story so they can decide whether they even want to bother to donate for such a, I mean, a, a, a masterpiece. Boy, um, yeah, see, I, I was all confident until you said that. <laughs> You've actually read the story, so you probably are a little more right than that. But uh, this is a story about a dude, played by Big Anklevich, who goes into a, a bar And there's an old man there who buys everybody a drink. And he wants to tell his story before he goes home to die. Hence, last call. And it's you and me and Marshall and the British girl and uh, Brian. I heard him. Yeah, Brian and... And a new voice actor, Ben Gifford, threw his voice into the ring. And... uh, I liked his voice, so maybe we'll have him do another episode. But anyhow, that is available now. It's all edited and ready to go. And uh, if you donate to the show, it is yours. I do have a podcast that dares not speak its name that's recorded. That's one of those incentive podcasts because, uh, well, imagine why. Uh, And and someday that will go out to people who are subscribers too, but... uh, it dares not speak its name, and it, it's better if we don't talk about it. <laughs> right. But uh, I do want to uh, end this show with, by thanking the people that have st- stuck with us all these years. We're getting close to, I think, six or seven years doing this. It might be seven. You know, a lot of times the show has wavered. But there have always been fans that are like, oh, like another show, I can't wait. Or when will there be another show, I can't wait. Or another show, I can wait. <laughs> and so I appreciate the people that uh, help us out with that or, you know, help us out with moral support and the people that donate who help us out with financial support. This uh, microphone I'm, I'm speaking into, I, I don't think I would have this if it weren't for people uh, that were fans of the Dunes too. Yeah. We got announcer man's hip replaced. And also uh, we, we used the donation money to get uh, announcer man's voice replaced that time when, uh, what are the things in there? Your tonsils or your lar? What is laryngitis? La- that's that afflicts the larynx. Yes. Yeah, his his larynx had to be removed, and we got it replaced with donation money. Smoke a lot, I guess that happens. But it's nice to be able to still or have. Don't all your friends smoke pipes? <laughs> still nice to be able to to have the money to take care of that. Yeah, because if we hadn't been able to fix announcer man's voice, 
we would have just had to use the same lines that he had given us in previous episodes, and nobody wants that. How about that dollhouse, huh? Yeah, nobody wants that to happen. That would that would just be annoying, you know. Rish might write a a, a sketch all about saying "f you" to those guys that kept using the same lines over and over again from announcer. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget the Spanish Inquisition. All right, folks. Okay, anything more, sir, at the end? I don't think so. I think we're good. Amazingly, we actually have two episodes recorded. So uh, it's been a really long time since that has happened. So it shouldn't be forever before you hear another Doomsday. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. So, yeah, thanks for everybody. To, uh, thanks to everybody, sorry, that helped us. The moral support thing, like you were saying before, that, that's really something special. It really helps. And, um, yeah, it's awesome to have people that like us and like what we do. And uh, I definitely want to do more, so I'm glad we have two in the can. None of that talk now. Uh, that we can give them, and hopefully we can keep this up. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, yeah, we never fail to thank our listeners on our podcast i raised my kids better than that my kids i raised them even better than that they they thank homeless people that are asking them for donations they thank crank callers for calling them up at home they even thank telemarketers well we, we had it rough when i was a kid um <laughs> luxury <laughs> thanks for listening everybody i'm big anklevich and I'm Rish Outfield. <laughs> Good night, folks. See you later. Why not? The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Good night. Take two. Did we forget anything? Did we thank Justin Charles? Justin Charles was not involved in this one. <laughs> He's involved in everything. <laughs> well, of course, we had it bad before Justin Charles... He had to spend every single waking hour editing the show, stay up till 4 or 5 a.m. on days when you had to go to work, recording the show. Okay, so lead us in a, a clap, please. Lead us in a clap? Yes. What does that mean, like... One, two, three. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> That's what you mean by a clap. Okay. Let's so, go. What? Is Tinkerbell dying? No. <laughs> this is the clap. This is our version of the clapper board at the start of a film to, to get everything synced. So you guys are all going to clap by your mic, and we'll use that to get everybody synced up. Okay. So one, on three. Okay. Not on after three. three. One. Not one, two, three. Clap. But one, two. Clap at three. Okay. One, two. Uh, well, all my kids are going to be on welfare and on drugs and maybe cannibals. Wow. You know, you're the most progressive of the... <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I would never give my children a bedtime. Of course not. They should decide on their own when they want to sleep. If they even want to sleep at night. What a jerk. I knew there was something wrong with that guy. It's <laughs> hilarious, man. Right? <laughs> wow. Just well, I, I I finally finished. And now it's time for plug it in. Plug it in. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's awful. Okay. I wish. Wasn't there a football player named Gifford? Yeah, Frank Gifford. Frank Gifford, husband of Kathy Lee Gifford. You take that back. No American football player would ever marry that. Well, he was way older than her, so, you know, she was young tang for him. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry.
Let me tell you of the days of the Doonspeak Audio Fiction Magazine. And now behold your hosts, the Dread Big Anglovich and the infamous Rishoutfield. 